Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeremy Pico Clement, uh, Photonic Technology Manager at EPIC, and I'm really pleased to welcome you for this uh, online technology meeting on Photonics for Earth Observation. So, we'll have six speakers today uh, from all the value chain of the Photonics, uh, from the component manufacturer to the system integrator. Um, just a reminder, it's, it's a live event, so feel free to ask any question you will have uh, in the chat uh, on Zoom or by raising your hand uh, through them during the, the Q&A session after each presentation. So what is EPIC? EPIC is the largest uh, photonics industry association with more than 800 members working in the photonics field. Uh, here is the EPIC team made on 10 people all passionate by, uh, by photonics. So we try to act as a catalyzer for the photonics industry by maintaining a strong network interaction between our members, uh, by organizing uh, physical and online events, publishing markets and technology reports, organizing technical workshops, and with a lot of other activities you can find uh, on our website. So here is the event and marketing management team. And here is the technology man management team. We have uh, Antonio Castello, uh, our expert on laser and medical market. We have Ivan, um, who is the co moderator of, of, the, of the meeting today, uh, who is in charge of PIX technologies and quantum market. And I am personally in charge of optics and micro optics and agri and green photonics market. So here are the next uh, physical events we will organize. So as you can see, many physical events. I wanted to highlight the EPIC annual general meeting in Helsinki, Finland, um, in March 2023. But we'll have also uh, other physical meeting uh, next year. And for example, we'll have something about uh, fiber sensor at HBK uh, in Portugal, something about AOVR at JBL Optics in Germany. In May and in September, we'll have uh, an EPIC meeting on Photonics in Defense in Poland. We we'll organize as well a lot of online technology meetings like this one. So we'll have in December Photonics for food and beverages, uh, something about metamaterials and meta lenses in January, something about micro LED, bioimaging, climate change monitoring, maybe something that could, could interest you, uh, something about quantum or ever than agrophotonics. And I re really invite you to, to check our website if you want or if you need more information about this. So I wanted also to give a special thanks to uh, our today's sponsors. Uh, so we have Iridian, Aspherican, Actar Advanced Coating, and Essent Optics. And I will uh, give the floor to, um, to our sponsor just to introduce their company. So uh, Jason, if you want to introduce Iridian. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. We're gonna uh, be presenting as part of today's uh, OTM. So Iridian's, uh, we, we design and manufacture custom optical filters. Uh, Earth observation um, is one of the um, uh, markets that we address. We address terrestrial telecom, spectroscopy, um, uh, remote sensing, 3D uh, entertainment as well. But uh, I'll get into the Earth observation more in uh, today's uh, OTM. Thank you, Jason. And yeah, we will have a presentation. So yeah. we give more information. We have also Aspherican uh, as our sponsor. So we have Mathieu Frambourg. Uh, Mathieu, if you want to give a few words about Aspherican. Sure. So uh, I'm Mathieu Frambourg. I'm the head of space project for Aspherican. Uh, well, we were created 20 years ago with the vision to uh, offer Aspherical optical components like standard products uh, without any compromise on the quality. And we have worked a lot to improve the standardization of those description of aspherical components. We are doing now the same for freeform components. And as we have already proven uh, space modified because we have some flying components, we think that obs Earth observation has major interest in considering those kind of surfaces of non-typical surfaces. So we're here to uh, make things real. Thank you, Mathieu, for this introduction. Um, Acta Advanced Coating is uh, one of uh, our other sponsor of this to this OTM, and we have um, Alexander Tell. Alexander? Thank you, Jeremy. My name is Alexander Telle. I'm the CEO of Actor's German subsidiary. Uh, Actor is a Israel-based technology company, and we are specialized in ultra-black space qualified coatings, coated foils, and coated components. Uh, we have a very long space heritage since over 25 years. We de deliver our coatings into photonic and optic uh, payloads for satellites. 
Uh, we are in all the big instrument missions from ESA, uh, NASA, um, but we do also deliver our absorbing coatings to sensors uh, like sun sensors and uh, star trackers. And um, yeah, you can find us in most of the um, satellite payloads uh, that you can imagine. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, last but not least, uh, FM Optics is uh, one of our sponsors, and we have Taras Lisuski. Taras, if you want to introduce uh, FM Optics, please. Taras, are you here? Maybe you are muted. Okay, now do you hear me? Yeah, good, good, good. Okay. Uh, a bit confused as I am supposed to deliver a um, small talk about our capabilities, but uh, will I have some time after that or not? Yeah, you, you, okay. How, how many minutes do you need? Just probably three, four minutes to discuss. Okay, so maybe I, I will give you a, a slot okay, between two, two speakers later. Okay, that's a point. That's a point. Thank okay. you very much. Perfect, perfect. So yeah, so if you want to get in touch with um, any of the participants today, uh, you can send us an email. So here is my email, Jeremy Pico Clement. And uh, you have also the email of Ivan Mikitsky, who is the co-moderator of this uh, today's event. Here is a um, uh, value chain of today's OTM. So all these companies uh, were registered to this event. And as you can see, we tried to cover all the value chain of the of photonics from the component manufacturer, metrology companies, R&D, of course, uh, system integrators and end users. So you, you could find this on uh, the web page of the event after, after, the, after to, today. And here is a panelist. So we'll start with Jason Palidwar from Iridian Spectral Technologies. We have a presentation from Fabrizio Preda from Mireos, Laurent Luong from Material Balsers Optics, Miri Pavlik from Stratosyst, Ruslan Ivanov from IR Nova, and uh, last but not least, William Rona from Oriba. So now I would like to invite Jason Palidwar to start your presentation, Jason. And I'm still sure. We okay there, Jeremy? Good. All right, so uh, again, thanks everyone. Looking forward to this uh, discussion today. So I'm Jason Palidwar product account manager, uh, group manager of aerospace and specialty optics here at Iridian Special, uh, Spectral Technologies. And I'll talk today about uh, our optical filters and how they relate to earth observation applications. So I'll begin with a brief introduction of who we are at Iridian. So I, I, as mentioned in the, uh, the sponsor uh, section, we uh, design and manufacture custom optical filter solutions. We're about 180 folks right now, all in that building you see there, except folks like me that are working from home when they can. Um, so we're based here in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, we were established in 1998, spinning out of the National Research Council of Canada, but we're a, a fully private company. We're ISO 9001-2015 certified as of May 2016. If this is a newer picture, you'd see our little sign in the top left of the building there. And we're registered as part of the Canadian Controlled uh, Goods Program. So we've been in this building since 2012. Um, and uh, next year, we'll be expanding over that parking lot you see there on the right as, as uh, we need more space to support uh, Earth observation, but also the other businesses that we uh, participate in. A lot of growth going on. So the uh, optical uh, filters and filter arrays that, that we um, design and manufacture, again, are cust custom builds. Uh, spanning the wavelength range of the upper end of the UV, anything above about 300 nanometers, out into the long wave infrared, as long as 15 uh, microns in terms of operating uh, wavelength range. We make optical filters that are single band filters, as well as multiple spectral bands on, on the same, uh, um, same uh, uniform filter performance. Additionally, multi-zone filter arrays, so spatially varying spectral performance. And I'll talk about the, uh, the arrays uh, in particular as they relate to uh, to our earth observation uh, customers. The size of the filters we manufacture vary anywhere from you know, sub millimeter for the uh, tele terrestrial telecom datacom up to as large as 150 millimeters for some of the astronomy or even some of the uh, solar ejection filters for, for some of the SATCOM applications. Technology is based on energetic uh, magnetron sputtering. We have 25 chambers, one of which is also equipped with evaporation, which allows us to address that 10 to 15 micron wavelength range that we can't otherwise address with our sputtered uh, technology. 
all of the coding platforms are controlled. Um, the designs uh, and, and in situ optical monitoring and optimization are controlled by custom in-house built software. And to, to address some of these arrays, we also have an in-house uh, photolithography lab to do uh, patterning um, of arrays. So I, I present this slide at most of the, 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 the talks I give. And so wh why, why Earth observation? Uh, why do we care? This is a, a, a quote that's often misattributed to Peter Drucker, but it's actually H. James Harrington. And it boils down to, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So Earth observation allows um, um, terrestrial, uh, us on Earth, to, to manage terrestrial phenomena like um, uh, forestry, agriculture, um, disaster response, um, uh, many different uh, um, earth, earthbound um, phenomena that we want to uh, manage, but by measuring from, from above, we get the perspective of space, we can look down, we can see, and then we can then manage those, those uh, aspects much better. So in terms of how optical filters interact with earth, earth observation, I'll talk about two aspects, our multi-zone filter arrays for multi-spectral imaging, as well as uh, single band filters that we've, uh, we've made for earth observation. So to start, um, I'll talk about the multi-zone filters, MZFs, are, are for multi-spectral imaging. So these filters are providing, as I say, spatially varying spectral performance. So taking a single detector and putting different spectral performance in front of pic uh, different pixels on the detector to allow that detector to, to um, measure uh, uh, different spectral phenomena simultaneously. And we can do that through a few different approaches. We can do a butcher block approach where we coat individual filters as we do for most of our business, cut them up and then assemble them edge on, uh, glue them together into um, uh, a butcher block array, uh, an assembled array of, of filters. We also can do photolithographically patterned filters where we take a single monolithic array, pattern and open up windows and coat into those windows the different spectral performance. Um, Thirdly, we can do a hybrid approach where we take a butcher block array and then coat a patterned black pa uh, um, uh, mask over the top of it, as you see in sort of the bottom uh, image there. Or we can take um, different pattern filters and assemble them together into a, a, um, a butcher block array. And there are trade-offs between when to use a butcher block versus when to use a pattern array. Patterned arrays have limits to the number of bands we can really practically successfully put down. Um, but they're monolithic and you can pattern any, any pattern you want. So we work with our customers to determine their needs and, and create a, 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 a filter that addresses them. Most cases, we're looking at uh, these sort of 2D linear arrays that you see here. Uh, the, the filters need to have high uh, in-band transmission and deep uh, out-of-band blocking. So really, we say about all our filters, we're providing more signal and less background to our customers' applications. Light where they want it, and not the light in the bands where they don't want it. To do that, uh, to provide that wavelength selectivity, we also need to avoid stray light, scattering from the edges of these, these parts. We need to be concerned about band to band coplanarity and in the butcher block arrays, how much the, the tilt and twist is between those different bands. And we need to be concern ourselves with um, the surface quality and defects in the coatings to minimize uh, pixels that are blocked out um, by by um, by defects in, in the coatings uh, themselves. So these are the the concerns and the challenges that we have as optical filter manufacturers to address these. And and we 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 address these again in a custom custom basis based on particular um, uh, customer uh, requirements. This is an example of some work we did, and really most of the work we do is for commercial folks. So I can't show you a lot of actual specs or details because it's it's all NDA and protected IP. But this is some work we did for uh, the Canadian Space Agency about a decade ago now um, on a multi-zone butcher block array. It's in the mid and long wave infrared region. So the spectral performance isn't what you'd see typically in a nice square uh, vis or near IR filters, as you'll see on, on our single band filter plots. But it's an example of, of, a, of an array where you have different, different bands that are going to be able to look at different science lines of interest in that application. And I'll hold up here just in the in the image, if you, if you can see, this is an example of more of a commercial one. So this is a Viz near IR array where we've taken many, many different spectral bands, glued them together, and then applied the, uh, the black patterned coating on. So this is an example of one of our commercial uh, uh, products we do for a commercial customer. And we have many, many of those 
uh, are currently flying in low Earth orbit, uh, looking at the Earth right now. So in terms of single band filter arrays, uh, an example we'll talk about is, is this uh, filter we've done for um, ESA's Mediasat third generation lightning imager project with uh, Talus and Leonardo. So the desire here was to look at a, a narrow oxygen triplet at 77.4 nanometers, but with a wide field of view to do lightning imaging from, from, from Earth orbit. So to, to do that, we needed a, a relatively narrow filter, as you can see in the, in the plot there, nice square top, decent blocking, but the challenge is over a large and uniform area to, to provide that large, that large uh, um, um, aperture to collect, collect the light. So we needed to have extreme uniformity on this filter. So we've achieved centering to within 10 picometers of target and, um, and, and maintaining that to within 100 picometers over the entire uh, 125 millimeter clear aperture. So what you see on the left here is a contour map, uh, spectral measurements across this 125 millimeter clear aperture. And essentially the entire, well, the entire green region is, is uniform and the, the light blue next to it is within 100 picometers of the target. So extremely uniform performance over a very large filter. The plot on the upper right shows a spectral measurement of this filter, but it is an A spectral measurement. Those are 69 different spectral measurements mapping across that entire clear aperture of that part. So essentially it's, 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 it's perfectly uniform. So this is an example of the type of single band filter that we can do for Earth observation. This is not typical. This is, this is a pretty heroic and expensive <laughs> filter. We do much, much simpler filters, but it's all based on the same technology, creating a, a, a square top uniform filter that we then process into the size needed for the customer. In this case, it was extremely large and uniformity was the challenge that we've managed to achieve. So we have a proven space heritage. We have a, a number of these, as I mentioned, these commercial products, our, our, our filters are flying with our, our commercial customers uh, instruments in, in uh, earth observation. So, and to do so, they have done testing on, we have done our own testing uh, for radiation exposure thermal cycling, vibration, uh, thermal vacuum tests, et cetera. So we're, we're able to uh, do testing in-house. We have our own um, um, thermal cycling. We have uh, uh, damp heat chambers. Uh, we, of course, outsource radiation testing. Um, but we, we have a, a well-established uh, history and heritage of, of making optical filters that, that will work in these space-based applications. So that's really us. Uh, that's that's the aspect of, of what we do in optical filters in terms of, of space. I'll 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 start uh, to answer the the famous Epic questions of uh, what can we do for Epic members and what can Epic members do for us. So um, what we can do for Epic members is what we've talked about here. Uh, Epic members that are needing an optical filter, uh, wavelength selectivity, either in a single band or or multi band arrays come to us and we will, we will work. Uh, you don't need to come to us with a detailed spec. We want to know the functionality that you, that you need and we'll work to develop the specification with you and then develop and, and um, manufacture the filters from low volume up to very high volumes. We tens of thousands of telecom filters ship a week so we can handle high, a low volume right through to high volume all from our operation here in Ottawa. In terms of what Epic members can do for us, well, you can come to us with your needs, but uh, also uh, we do need... Um, substrates. We use uh, uh, glass substrates, uh, radiation resistant substrates, um, the BK7 G18, uh, other, other uh, uh, alternatives to those substrates. And also we occasionally have needs for uh, these um, uh, testing um, programs to do some of the sort of radiation or vibration or these other type of testing aspects that, that we don't do in-house. So that's, that's where there might be opportunities for for some uh, Epic members to be uh, um, suppliers to us rather than customers. So uh, that's what I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for this uh, really interesting presentation. And we have um, already one question from Kerdui, uh, Jorge Julian Sanchez, please. You're on mute, Jorge. Yeah. I put I put the camera on, but not the micro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have, in fact, a twofold question. Let me let me enjoy. First of all, concerning co concerning coatings, uh, filterings, the the treatments you made. Can you mix metallic and the electric, or you just make only dielectric mirrors? 
we we can make metallic, but we really don't. Uh, we focus on the dielectric um, uh, workhorse materials in in the viz near IR, midwave IR. Uh, actually, in some instances where we've needed, say, gold or enhanced gold coatings, we've actually come to to Kurdry, uh okay. for for some of those those uh, instances where we've needed uh, uh, metallic coatings. Which is possible with our operation. We really, we're set up to do dielectrics, and it's a you know a lot of changeover to go back and forth. So dielectrics is our game. Okay, thank you. And, and the second one concerning concerning the multi filters, hmm. which is the maximum window range you can treat okay mm -hmm. for 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 a transmission higher than 20 90, 98. sorry i didn't understand the second part the uh okay. how many how many colors okay yep. oh sure and you said with a transmission higher of 98. a 98 percent well in 98 percent it's it's you know it, it's it all it all just depends on on the the other spectral performance that you, you can get a, a high transmission our filters um, do nothing to add transmission to to the glass. All we do is add blocking, right? All, so so we're taking a, a, a transparent glass. We're putting an AR coating on, and we're adding mm -hmm. selective selective blocking. So if the blocking is broad and and steep, then you may have to 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 compromise that 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 transmission. But you know, ninety eight percent can be achievable. Um, it up depends. To, it, 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 well, up to sorry, up to what wavelength range or in, in terms of wavelength range? Yeah. Oh, geez, that's more in the vis near IR. When we're working in the mid and long wave infrared, often you're looking at specs in the sort of the ninety percent uh, transmission level. And really, we're not often looking at ninety eight percent as specs in the vis and near IR. Most folks are are happy with ninety five percent type of transmission in band in in, in those on. in those wavelength regions. In terms of the number of bands that we can produce, it's it's. Um, yeah, it's a black coating with the filters, in fact. Well, no, but it's yeah, we we can we can glue as not so we've done we've done bands, uh, we've done as many as you know, almost 20 bands. You can do narrow 20. bands. Yeah, it, we're limited to to you know band widths, like physical uh, sizes on the order of about a millimeter wide. So you know, if you have 20 millimeters to work with, then probably not more than 20 bands is what we're going to be able to assemble in there. But when we're doing an assembly, really more bands isn't a problem. You just do more coating, uh, more individual coatings and add them together. When it comes to photolithography, it's very different. We're, we're doing about four, maybe five bands because these are complex coatings and you get compounding yields. If I have to do 10, 10 coatings in a row, uh, I'm, not, I'm never going to get to the end. I'm going to have a failed coating run and I'm never going to get my uh, photolithography. Yeah, five, seven, uh, practically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Thank right? you, Jorge, for our question. And we have another question from uh, Laurent Lyon, Matarion Director of Optics. Laurent, please. Uh, you're muted, Laurent. I'm muted, Laurent. Hello, Jason. How are you? I, I'm good, Laurent. How are you? Since we met in Dubrovnik, the good yes, time. It was. <laughs> okay. No, just a question to you, uh, Jason. Um, I'm interested to know how many bands are you able to put together with a butcher block approach? Because we know yes. it's a tricky As I say, technology. Yeah, and I say about about you know it it, it varies. Uh, most of the work we're doing is is you know, I don't know a lot of people are looking for eight, twelve bands. We've done as many as twenty bands. As I say, it's really it's really limited by the uh, the width of the the physical width of the bands that that we can uh, we can assemble together. So so we've we've done work up to about twenty bands. Okay, okay, yeah. but that's with the the, the the assembly, of course. As I say, with the yes, of course, of course. Oh. Yeah, thanks. You'll, you'll talk about that more as well with uh, your office. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. When I see your presentation, it looks almost the same as mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for the question. And we have a question from AT Optics, Andres Cifuentes. Please, Andres. You're mu muted. Hello. <laughs> yeah, good. Hi, Hi, thanks for that presentation. Thanks. Uh, um, very interesting. I have a question. Uh, do you work any? With any uh, polarization-based dielectric coatings, uh, we we can do so. We do some 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 polarization um, beam splitters. Uh, of course, only when working at angle. We're not you know, we can't work at can't can't do that at zero degrees. So, if folks are working at forty-five degrees or or non non-normal incidents, then we can provide 
a polarization selective uh, filters. But we're not doing you know polarizers uh, to say. Yeah, no, uh, I mean the, a polarization right. beam split at forty five yeah. degrees. It's something you could uh, handle. We, we, yeah, we can. We we like doing them, and I don't have an example here, but we'll say this: some some folks want cubes, beam splitter cubes. We've done some of that. We 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 don't do a lot of that. We'd much prefer plates. So if you're doing a plate polarizer, uh, happy to 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 look at uh, um, plate polarization. Uh, and and how thin can you make the substrate? Well, that again, this is a it's it's like the how how much transmission can we can we make? It's it's they're all trade offs, um, especially if you're looking for a filter that's um, going to work in both transmission and reflection. The thinner the filter, the more um, the more curvature you're going to get. You're going to start to affect reflected wavefront error. Now we can do a stress balancing coating on the back of that to try to flatten it. But the thicker the substrate, the easier that is. We we work typically with uh, if it's a standalone filter, one, two, three millimeters thick. We do half millimeter thick. The the arrays are often half millimeter or one millimeter thick. We have done individual filters, you know, sub half millimeter down to 300 microns thick, but the, you know, you probably not as, not as a filter of, of this, this size and certainly not something that has a, a strong uh, requirement for, for flatness or re reflective wavefront error. If it works in transmission only, you can get away with a little more because that curvature isn't going to affect your transmitted wavefront error so much, but sure. it really, really is going to kill reflected. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and Ruslan? Uh, please, from Ayanova with an Ivanov. Um, thanks for your presentation. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Um, so a question that I have is, um, if you have any experience of depositing the filters directly on top of, onto the surface of an image in array, have you ever done such a thing? No, and uh, no. Uh, so <laughs> we... Uh, in our in our energetic uh, sputtering environment, we haven't. We 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 were coating on opti on on the glass. We we tried. We some folks have asked for us to do work on polymers. We've tried that. That's that's that doesn't work. So really, we're coating on on glass itself. We're not putting uh, uh, elements into our coating platform. We just haven't done it. And uh, and we really, frankly, I don't know how much um, a detector would enjoy being inside our coater. Uh, in the environment in there, so um, so, so yeah, it would, sounds it would be, reasonable. Yeah, completely exploratory. So no, we haven't. Thanks. Thank yeah. you, Ruslan. Thanks a lot. And if we have no other question, thank you again, Jason, for your great presentation. Perfect. Thanks all. Thanks a lot. And now let's move on with our next speaker, Fabrizio Preda from Neros. Fabrizio, please, you can share your screen and start your presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. So hello, everyone, again. I'm Fabrizio from Nerios. Um, and today I'm going to present you briefly uh, our novel ultra-compact hyperspectral imager in the thermal infrared and some application, let's say, for Earth ob observation. Just a few words first on, on the company. Um, so Nerios is an innovative startup company. We are a spin-off uh, company of Politecnico di Milano University. We are based in Milan in Italy. Uh, the company is pretty young, uh, so we've been incorporated in May 2018. Um, we are growing quite fast, I would say. We are now 10 people employed. Basically, we develop and manufacture novel devices for spectroscopy, such as interferometers, spectrometers, multispectral and hyperspectral cameras. Um, for those of you who, who might not know what a hyperspectral camera is, uh, basically, a hyperspectral camera is a camera that captures the spectrum of the light for each and every pixel of the image. And differently for multispectral, where you typically have a discrete set of bands, like eight, 10 bands typically, in the hyperspectral, you get really the entire spectrum of the light. Here, you can see a picture of the two commercial products we have now on the market. You can see the black uh, version, let's say, which is the VSNIR, covering up to one micron wavelength. And then you have the SWIR model, the red one, which covers up to 1.7 uh, micron wavelengths. Just in details and let's say an overview of the working principle of our technology, basically we work with a Fourier transform approach. So a Fourier transform approach, let's say in the single pixel detector, in the single pixel case, what you have is you have an interferometer at first that creates two replicas of the incoming light that impinge on the detector. And suppose you have a single pixel detector, what it measures is a 
variation of intensity as a function of the delay tau, and then you get the Fourier transformer of this signal and you get the spectrum of the light. Now, with a hyperspectral camera, the uh, work is, is easy. <laughs> Let's say if you replace the single pixel detector with a camera lens and a B-dimensional detector, basically the interferometer creates two replicas of the image of the scene you're looking at. And by scanning the interferometer, basically you collect a a multiple monochromatic images of the scene as a function of the delay. And then pixel by pixel, you compute the Fourier transformation so that for each and every pixel, you get the spectrum and thus the hyperspectral image. So that's the very general working principle of the, of the cameras we have. And these are the main, let's say, differences or advantages, depending on the application, of course, of this technology. So first of all, it's quite compact and lightweight if we compare with other similar devices. It provides high spatial and spectral resolution, which can be varied simply via software without affecting the throughput of light. And this is a quite unique um, feature. And then it provides a very high optical throughput and therefore sensitivity. It's very stable and broadband. So the interferometer itself we have is very broadband. The limiting factor is the sensor, so the responsivity of the sensor itself. So these hyperspectral cameras, we have been applying it for ground applications in the last years, such as um, you know, microbiology it can be coupled very well to microscopes as well, for example, vegetation studies, remote sensing, plastic sorting, and food quality control and cultural heritage. So it's very, very versatile and, and flexible. So now, as the topic today is space, what's next for us? So recently, uh, we have started an exciting project with the European Space Agency for the development of a novel version of this technology, which is suitable for uh, the thermal infrared. So to perform hyperspectral imaging from the space in the thermal infrared. Now, of course, the, the project is in the very beginning of its phase. So we are developing the first prototypes at very low TRL now, uh, but the first results are very promising. Of course, I don't have an actual data from the space to show you today. Uh, so I will concentrate in the next slides more, let's say on the motivation and the expected outcome. So first of all, the question can be why hyperspectral and why not multispectral? Uh, here I'm reporting a few examples, of course, cannot be exhaustive in these few slides on some uh, missions, on some spectrometers on, uh, which are now in orbit. And basically these kind of spectrometers, they provide multispectral systems. So they have either five or eight, again, typically multispectral image is around 10, between 10 and five and 10 bands in the thermal infrared. Here you can see, for example, a graph where you can see the bands of the high spirey project. And you have eight different bands spanning from four microns up to 12 microns approximately. Of course, this, uh, the, the selection of the bands limit in some cases the application you can, you can perform the measurement for. Uh, in, another limitation of having a multispectral system can be the resolution of the bands. So in some cases, this provides limited, let's say, spectral resolution, which can limit the performances in accuracy in determining what you look at, basically. So in some cases, hyperspectral imaging can be a bit more powerful than multispectral imaging. Of course, you need to pay some price to obtain a hyperspectral image, such as measurement time, cost, but in some cases it can be useful. An example, um, for instance, can be uh, this one. So the detection of mineral or geology more in general. Here you can see on the right, a picture in false colors. Uh, this is, you can find it on the website, on, on the internet. You can see the distribution, the spatial distribution of different features, such as the quartz features from carbonates and quartz poor regions. So this is a detection, automatic detection of, of you, you know, rocks. But here on the left, actually, you can see the transmission spectra in the thermal infrared from two to 14 microns of different kinds of rocks. And you can see the, different, um, the difference between what a multispectral system can provide, which have the dots, just these points, versus what a hyperspectral measurement can provide. So of course, with a hyperspectral data, you can obtain a much bigger amount of information. Uh, for example, look at the marble here. You have two strong peaks of absorption. If you have multispectral system, you might not be able to get exactly, exactly the, the absorption lines. So in some cases, having a hyperspectral can be useful. And then why thermal infrared? and not in the visible near infrared. So we, we have decided to go up to the thermal infrared, meaning from three to 14 microns, 
because uh, there we you, you can get some further information with respect to the visible and near, near IR region, especially because in the visible and near IR, basically the, the light that you look at from the space is just a scattered solar radiation. Whereas in the thermal infrared, what you, what you get, the light that you measure is the light which is emitted by the earth itself, which act as a black body. And so what you can measure really with the thermal infrared is something further uh, on top of absorption, reflection and scattering of molecules. You can also measure the temperature or the albedo, the radiance or the emissivity. Uh, on top of that, if you measure in the infrared, what you can measure is also the directly the vibrational modes of some molecules, the absorption line of gases, for example. And so you can get some further information um, of chemical compounds, let's say of surfaces and atmosphere. So here I'm depicting some possible applications we are now evaluating uh, for our project. Of course, the major ones are greenhouse gases detection from the space, you can measure or detect the effect of earthquakes, volcanoes, or wildfires. Again, earth composition and geology is a very hot topic at the moment, and water pollution, of course, as well. Now, the, the camera that we, that we have, as I was mentioning to you before, employs a staring approach, meaning that in order to acquire the full hyperspectral image, you need to acquire um, multiple monochromatic images of the scene you're looking at in order to reconstruct, of course, the entire hyperspectral image. And the measurement time of each acquisition is, can vary depending on the condition from, let's say, one millisecond to one second. And so the full measurement time for the entire hyperspectral image can vary from a few seconds up to one minute, two minutes. And during this measurement time, of course, we need to look at the very same scene. Of course, the satellite is moving on top of the Earth during the measurement. So we uh, we aim to have you know a fixed point setting approach so the vehicle or the optical system has to rotate during me the measurement to maintain you know fixed the the uh, fixed aim point during the pass of course this system has been uh, is already employed by many different satellites um, on orbit so basically you need to collect multiple images reconstruct them all so overlap them all and then compute the Fourier transformation so that's uh, something that we have already tested on ground and it works pretty nicely um, and yeah then the, the suggested low uh, orbit is the lowest orbit so around 700 kilometers from the surface so that's very it uh, this is the a picture we took last week uh, i was in the european space agency in the netherlands uh, for uh, some activities related to this project and here in the picture you can see what well, myself the representative of the european space agency and Christian and uh, Andre, which are the representative of other two partners of the project, which is the Italian National Institute of Research and BBT, uh, which is a Czech company uh, producing specific um, optics for, for the thermal infrared. Uh, with that, I thank you all for the attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Really interesting presentation. Is it a new product you just presented? The hyperspectral camera it actually is on the market since one year or two years, actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, the, the, the version in the thermal infrared is not on the market anyway. So okay. And it's, it's, it's already used in some projects, specific project with ESA. That's it. That's what you explained. Yeah. Let's say the, the, the version in the visible and near infrared or SWIR is already on the market for ground yeah, applications, okay. while the version for the thermal infrared that require some specific developments we are developing right now in collaboration with the European Space Agency. Okay. And, uh, yeah, really cool, really interesting. Um, so do we have any questions from uh, this participant, from the attendees? I saw... Uh, I saw the question from uh, Mathieu from INO. Yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so it's really interesting what you presented. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I was very well aware because my I spent my life at ABB before being at INO. So I, I know a lot about the um, free and transforming spectrometer. Um, I got the question though, um, regarding the time, the, the timing of the acquisition of the image, you know, I see that it could, you know, it could last a few seconds to a few, even a few minutes. Uh, what do you think about the, um, dissemination of your solution on the uh, low Earth orbit, because, you know, at six kilometers per second, round speed, uh, 
that will create you know a very um, medium resolution image such as maybe a kilometer by a kilometer so what is your take about that Yes, let's say the measurement time can vary. So I, I, I'm, we are aware that a few minutes can be um, problematic if you want to achieve very fine spatial resolutions, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the, basically, the, the, from the estimations we have done and the calculations we have done, you can reach uh, one, two minutes. Of course, you need to track, you know, uh, this. this yeah, you but look at. you will have some distortion due to the exactly. track. Exactly, so. exactly. So the, the calculations we have done was uh, were also dependent on the off 90 angle. So if you go at an off 90 angle, which is not mm -hmm. 90 degrees, you can, uh, let's say, overcome partially this, this problem. But of course, um, there are, draw there are um, compromises. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what about, you know, uh, geostationary orbit? You know, we, there, uh, I, I don't know if there is the launch, if MTG, the uh, metal satellite generation um, was launched or not yet, but, you know, your system could be very interesting in, in such applications. You know, being at geo, you, you, you remain at the same position. Uh, you know, a matter of fact, when I was at ABB, we, 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 we were planning something like that. And it was... Uh, another competitor that uh, have done that but uh, it is definitely I think for you worthwhile to, to see whether you can do that in geostationary for sure you will have maybe two by two two by two kilometers um, ground resolution but still at Rio due to the speed and the time of acquisition you, acquisition, you will have the same so um, just maybe an idea for you but it's uh, and uh, no, it's uh, but it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for the suggestion. Uh, actually, yeah, as we are at the very, very beginning of the project, we, we let's say we, we are now developing the, the technology. In the mm -hmm. future project, we also take into account, you know, orbits and this kind of stuff. So it's a decision still to be made in the future. So yeah, thanks a lot for, for, for the suggestion. That's it. Thank you, Mathieu. That's an option. For your suggestion. Thanks, and we have a question from Ruslan Ivanov. I don't know about please, um, Ruslan. Developing on the suggestion by uh, Mathieu, is it like the triplets of satellite? Isn't it another way of going around this problem? You would obviously need a very well calibrated focal plane array in the sensors, but then you would kind of trade yeah, the cost of launching three for a cost of one for better spatial resolution of the entire system. Uh, that, that's it. That you I want don't... to comment? Yeah, no, I agree with you. Of course, it's, it's a matter <laughs> of, of, you know, of, of compromise concerning also the costs, as you say. Uh, but again, uh, being at a very early, early stage of the project, these details on the orbit and you know this kind of stuff has um, to be but, determined. Okay, also. but then then I have another question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the visible, obviously, I could imagine that you could maintain the size of the system of the spectrometer pretty small for the reason that the detect that the sensor itself is a compact one. You don't have the cooling system attached to it, right? Is it like what it, like? How bigger is it? I mean, I wanted to start with this question, but then you have mentioned that it is in the development stage. So I suppose that the size is not exactly one of the variables that you have fixed at the moment. But like, do you have any ideas about like, is it going to be twice bigger, 50%, 20% bigger than the system that you are promoting for the visible applications? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are in development phase, of course, so not defined yet, but the idea that we have is, you know, the, the comparison that I would do right now is not considering the detector because any, uh, you know, measurement system uh, will, will have the, a detector. So, but if you compare the spectrograph that you would use in a dispersive approach with respect to the interferometer that we have here, so let's uh, concentrate only in the spectral part without the detector, then uh, the interferometer we have is really compact. So you have like a few centimeters uh, thick uh, interferometer with respect to maybe meter and one meter square of, uh, of the spectrograph that, that you would need in another approach. And so let's say the, the compactness and the lightweight of the system is one of the key points of this technology. 
Then, of course, you need to add the telescope, you need to add the detector, but these are other stuff that we do not develop. So, so you, you keep it modular, I get it. Exactly, at least for the moment. Good, thank you, Ruslan. Again, for a question, and, and Laurent, please. Laurent from Material Basel Optics. Yes, uh, ciao Fabrizio. Um, I was just curious to, to know if uh, you already have some good partner for the TIR band, because this is exactly the kind of product we are addressing on that market. Mm -hmm. And we already did a, a lot of butcher block array with TIR band. So in case you have some interest, please do not hesitate to, to get in contact with us. Huh? Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Yes, thanks a lot. I, I already noted down your, your name actually before. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> thanks a lot for this. Good, perfect. Ivan, please. Yeah, there was also another uh, question from the audience uh, from uh, Diogo from Aurora Tech. He was asking uh, what kind of uh, detector is used in uh, in the camera? Is it uncooled? So in the commercial products we have, we, we use an uncooled, of, of course, version for the, 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 the silicon-based detector up to one micron. It's not cooled. It is cooled in the sphere version. Uh, of course, it will need to be cooled also in the thermal infrared. OK, thank you. Jeremy, back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Fabrizio, for this interesting presentation. Thank you. And good discussion. So now let's uh, go with Laurent Luong from uh, Matalion Belzer Optics. Laurent, if you want to yes. share your presentation and start. Can you see my screen, okay. gentlemen? Yes. And let's raise the presentation mode. Okay. So good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the optics that our company is able to offer for the Earth observation market. So first, a word about the history of the two companies. So actually, Matalion Balzer Optic is a, is a, is a joint company now. So both, both branch has a long history. So Balzers was established in the 60s, and you can see it was uh, renamed through rebrand through different names. What is important here is that uh, uh, they acquired MSO Yana in 2010, and uh, we have uh, we have all the space activity for the European side based in Yena. We have, uh, we have uh, six people dedicated to space product working permanently in Yena. On the US side, uh, the, the heritage is coming from uh, Bar Associate, which has uh, a, a good knowledge for, for space since uh, over than uh, 50 years. And there was a good complementary uh, situation between Yena and, uh, and Bar because uh, Yena has some good experience in the UV, visible and near infrared, and, and Bar has some good experience up to the medium wave infrared and long, long wave infrared. So in, two, in 2020, Matayon, uh, Matayon Group acquired ba Optics Balzer including Yena. So now we have uh, two facilities to address the space business. One in Yena with uh, all his skill and, and one is Westford nearby Boston for the US part. The product we see for the Earth observation market are the, the same kind of product that Jason introduced previously. So we can offer the multi-band array, either in mono monolithic approach or butcher approach. Each approach has its own advantage. Um, the monolithic approach is interesting when we have a grating configuration for the, for the spectrometer, because we can offer uh, order sorting filter to clean the, the, the order in order to get a good signal. We can also offer to this market uh, the graded filter, like linear variable filter, either in band pass, high pass, or low pass. We also have some, uh, some good activity for beam splitter, because you need to separate the, 
the visible from the infrared or sometimes the, the infrared, uh, the, the, the near infrared for, from the far infrared and so on. And lastly, we have some, um, some mirror activity for the, for, for the telecom market. For the monolithic filter array, so we are able to provide up to um, five or maximum six filters in a monolithic approach. The reason for that is that uh, you can imagine that it's done by a lithography process. So after a certain uh, amount of uh, steps, the yield may, may become an issue. So we, we, we did, uh, in the base case, uh, six, six uh, monolithic array. On the left side, you can see an example of a CO2M map filter we did for, for this experiment. The center version is an example of a LOIS order sorting filter with only three zones. And on the right side, you can see a, a coating we did directly on a CMOS wafer. And I, I note that Rushlan Ivanov was interested to know if we can put filter on directly on wafer. So this is a one capability that we have in Yena, we are able to, uh, to deposit uh, a pattern uh, filter directly on silicon wafer. So Rushland, do not hesitate to get in contact with us after the call. Multispectral filter array is uh, very close to what, um, what Jason described again. We are able to address uh, the, the range from, <coughs> sorry, from 180 nanometer up to 30 micron. So the concept is, is like the one described by Iridian. So we, we, are, we are depositing a filter on wafer. We are, we are then dicing with uh, the wafers. The good thing is that we can select the good part of the wafer and then we are building the assemble. Uh, the other advantage of this technique is we are able to put some, uh, some black coating in between uh, two uh, neighbor uh, bands in order to improve the, the optical crosstalk. This black coating is providing OD5 uh, uh, separation between, uh, between bands. And we also do some black coating at the entrance of the filter you know, in order to get rid of uh, the chips you can get when we are dicing the part. An impressive uh, things for this technology is that we demonstrated the, the possibility to, to do more than 100 band stick together. Here you have an example. It's, a, it's, it's not a um, drawing. It's actually a picture of a 100 band assembly we did for a US customer. And you can imagine that each band has the thickness of the air, like uh, typically uh, 50 micron. We can do that with a typical stick length up to uh, 150 millimeter. So I mean, and we can do that in the visible and also in the in the in the far infrared. This technology is, uh, is used in uh, is West Ford. So I mean, depending on the need from the customer, we can either propose uh, the the monolithic or the butcherable car, each approach uh, having his own, um, his own advantage. Graded uh, coatings, this is one example of uh, what we did for, for uh, Copernicus Sentinel-5 project. So the principle is uh, that we are, uh, we are using some shadowing technique in order to create a, a graded coating. Here, this is an example of a long uh, short pass filter. And depending on the position on, on, on the filter, you are going to achieve different spectral results. Some companies are starting now to think to use a, a short pass and long, long pass filter. And you can imagine by combining uh, some mechanical movement between both of them, you can actually uh, build some kind of band pass variable linear, uh, linear variable filter, which is a, a technique which is used which can, can be used also for, for industry.
large, uh, large uh, dichroic uh, beam splitter is also something that uh, we could achieve. We, we did that for uh, Indiana for Sentinel-2 project. I think there was a question from, uh, from a gentleman from uh, AZ Optics for, uh, for large beam splitter. And this is something we can also propose on the market. And here we see that uh, we can control uh, the polarization to, to that level. So the, the size of, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> of this uh, dichroic uh, beam splitter is quite big, but we could achieve it uh, using our uh, ion assisted deposition system. Last but not least, we'd, we'd like to, to show the, that we are also able to, uh, to address uh, large optics coatings. We see an interest in the market for, um, for uh, telecommunications, meaning that we need to, to be able to coat quite large amount of quantity of, of mirror. So we can coat up to 1.4 in, in our big system, which is up to 1.4 meter, we are able to, to, to optimize the coating cost of a large amount of, of mirror. So the summary, uh, gentlemen, is that, uh, so depending on, the, on your need, we can offer it either from Westford or, or Yena. Uh, the filtering configuration between butter block and monolithic is really depending on, on the, the customer specification. Monolithic has some advantage when you want a very precise uh, coating structure. You have uh, no dead zone in case of butcher block array, you may have some small dead zone. And we can also offer the, the graded linear variable filter. For the grading configuration, which is used, for example, for Shime or Flex project, we are a partner uh, offering order sorting filter to eliminate uh, the multi-order uh, diffraction. A new thing that is also on the market is uh, we are starting to have some hybrid demand, like Jason mentioned. So it can be butcher block together with a monochromatic uh, filter, but we are also able to provide a linear variable filter plus panchromatic band, for example. Uh, so, I, I mean, uh, what is interesting is that uh, the market is, is really uh, going in some kind of hybrid approach, which we, we can address with uh, Yena and, and, uh, and Westford factory. And last, last is, uh, is our uh, big chamber. So if you have any inquiry for SATCOM mirrors, where volume is needed, we, we are also happy to, um, to address this market. Is there any question? Thank you, Laurent. Yes, we have, uh, we have, we have some questions. Uh, first one from, uh, from Jason, <coughs> Jason Iridian Spectral Technologies, please. Hey, Laurent, you're, you're right. Our presentations are similar. I think we're brothers. Um, the, uh... Which is good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, it's a big market out there, a lot, lot for all of us to participate in. Uh, yeah, the L sure. uh, LVFs was interesting to me, the graded filters. I've seen you know, a lot of activity there historically from folks like Delta in the, in the, the Viz range. But what, what, what wa wavelength range do you cover? Because we've had some inquiries out in the sort of the mid and long wave infrared. We really don't do this. And I'm just curious as to do you, how far out into the IR do you go if you go into the IR? No, no, it's a good question, Jason. Uh, we are only addressing the um, visible and near infrared. We, we are not sure. going in the far area. But oh, okay. it, it, it seems there is a, a demand for that. And, uh, Agreed. And I already addressed this question to Westford because Westford has the capability for the infrared. And maybe we should look at that. I mean, if you have some exciting inquiry, maybe we can co collaborate on that topic and, and try to find out a common solution. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I, I, because I, occasionally I do get, you know, do you do LVS and the answer is usually no, and do you, you know, or do you know who does them in the midwave IR? And, and I, I, I really am not, not terribly aware. So yeah, we, we should be in, we keep in touch, Lauren. Thanks. Yeah. Good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Um, Mathieu, Mathieu Frambo from Atherican, please. Uh, hello, Lauren. Um, well, 
similar presentation, so a similar question probably, but it was not asked. Uh, to you, uh, do you also have uh, metal mirrors capabilities in Europe or in the US? This is something we have looked at, but uh, uh, currently we are we don't have any development or plan to offer metal mirror. Uh, uh, you mean metal filter? Huh? No, oh, metal filter yeah. or metal mirrors, like gold, uh, gold yeah. coating or silver coating. Okay, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Sorry, I, I thought you were talking about uh, some kind of hybrid approach uh, to, 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 to use some metal uh, structure. No, not to... yet. <laughs> okay. No, no, we, we definitely have some uh, capability uh, in offering silver, gold, or aluminum mirror. We have uh, aluminum mirror which are space qualified. We are working on gold. Gold, to, uh, we have some gold topic where we are aiming to, to have some qualification and also for silver yes uh, we, we can do that definitely yes okay thank you good thanks Mathieu for a question and uh, another one from uh, Jorge Julian Sanchez from Cardi please Jorge thank you yes, just a short question concerning your multicolor filters which is in concerning your little uh, capabilities, which is your resolution, maximum resolution for this type of application? Yeah, typically, typically, uh, we go down to 20 micron. But if you look, George, if you look at the, uh, yeah, you see here the juice, the juice uh, filter we made, the filter size is typically 18 by 18 micro for each pixel, which is typically at the limit of what we can offer. Okay, but for example, for example, I'm, for example, in the in the filters with black coat included, uh, which is the resolution in the butcher approach? Ah, for the for the butcher approach. Yeah. You mean here? Yeah. There, for example, no, yeah, for example, there. So resolution, you mean the- Resolution the, between the stripes, which is your yeah, resolution okay. to- perform. Okay, so here, for example, each stripes is 50 macro. So it's like a hair. And I know that we made some kind of uh, experiment for, for uh, a big US company agency and we were able to uh, to make uh, a prototype with 12 bands which were 15 micro okay for One five for 10 we perform down to four three microns just to let you know that's great <laughs> and it's not a development it's already we have customers there you okay can, okay so later, oh. perhaps we can change if you want right? Let, to check whether we can do something for you. Yes, and, and, and the same on your side will be, you know, it's always good to, to talk about uh, what uh, each one, each of us can do, uh, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Are you based in France or somewhere else? I'm, I'm in Lannion, you may, you may ah. know. C'est Cadri. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm far. I mean, I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in Porniche nearby Nantes. So we are only two I know. hours right. each other. So we, we can meet anytime. Anytime we will may discuss further applications and joint collaboration. That great, okay? great, so, perfect. Thank you, Ma uh, Matrium. Thanks a lot, Jorge, for the question. And if we have no other question, I would like to thank again uh, Laurent Luang. Thanks a lot for our presentation, Laurent. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jeremy. And uh, if you, yeah, if, yeah, thank you for <coughs> your presentation. And now uh, we'll ask to Ethan Optics, um, Taras Fitsuski, you are a sponsor of uh, this meeting. And uh, I will share um, your presentation. So it's just two slides. Yes, Taras, you can. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to meet of you, all of you here, and thank you for giving the floor to me. Um, my name is Taras, I'm representing Ascent Optics, a company uh, which is based in Vilnius, Lithuania. And for the last 13 years, we are involved in developing development of 
spectral measurement systems for optical coatings. Actually, this is our one and the only business. And in the beginning, I'd like to add a couple of words to the message from Jason. He mentioned that in his presentation that you cannot control if you don't measure. Uh, from the metrology side, we normally say you cannot produce any better than you measure. And uh, this is actually the, uh, the core philosophy of our business, which we communicate to our customers and partners. Uh, today, I would like to grab some moments of your time to de describe a small part of our activities, which is related to the spectral measurements of optical filters for Earth observation, particularly about the multi-zone filters. Uh, you see them on the picture, they are used for spectral separation of different zones. And um, these zones are very spatially distributed on the substrate. And final products, the final substrates are very customized for size, spectral performance, number, size, and location of zones. So this is a challenge to measure these filters because uh, sometimes the zones can be less than one millimeter. Uh, layout of zones is customer specific and filter size can vary depending on the mating array. Uh, as a result, the measurement procedure is a time killer. Occasionally, uh, and Jason also mentioned this, XY mapping is needed to check the uniformity of the coding along the whole area of the substrate. So we had one customer which approached us with a question or a challenge to measure these type of filters. Uh, we uh, decided to use our standard photon RT spectral photometer, and we have designed XY MZF motorized stage for this application. With this stage, the customer can put this filter in the holder and scan both horizontally, horizontally and vertically running a mapping of the filter and simultaneously spectral measurement. So on the plot, in the, on the left plot, you see the mapping structure of the filter. Each colored zone represents the width of individual zone on the filter. And this uh, data is stored in the memory of the computer. And then the next scan, uh, the system runs spectral measurement of each zone and uh, shows on the screen the, uh, the spectra of the bandpass filters, which you see on the bottom right picture. Uh, we have also tested this technology for linear variable filters and it works very well. Uh, currently we can cover from visible to midwave infrared and so far, so good, to be honest. Um, typical questions from EPIC members and from EPIC team is that, what can we do for you and what can you do for us? Uh, from our side, from our end, definitely we are providing really nice spectral measurement solutions. Uh, fully unattended, fully automatic, uh, and uh, highly welcomed by many customers around the world. What can you do for us? We are constantly looking for a broadband compact light sources with high illumination density. This is a, a core search point right now for our company. And obviously, please challenge us with any puzzling questions which you may have for spectral measurements of the coatings. Thank you very much. You're welcome to ask any questions. Thank you, Taras. And thank you again for sponsoring this event. Uh, yeah, we have just one question from Jason uh, Palinwa. Jason. Hey, Terrace, very interesting. Um, it, are you offering this as sort of a commercial package? Like here, here's this huh? measurement or, or, so, or, or, or a service, send it to you. No, 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 or, we, or we, don't, we don't provide any, any measurement services. We are Perfect. a manufacturer of the systems. So we are delivering our spectral photometers to the customers. Right, including this stage, like so. Sure. Sure. Uh, and now, can they measure? I put my demo away. Both a cross band and a long yeah. band. Right, X okay. Y, X Y. Yeah. 
I'll I'll shoot you in the chat. I'll shoot you my contact info. It's uh, interesting technology. You might be interested in. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank Good, you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for the question, Jason. Again. Uh, so let's move. We are our next speaker, uh, Yiri Pavlik from Stratosist. Yiri, uh, can you start start sharing your presentation? Start sharing your presentation. Hello, everybody. Hello. So my name is Yiri and uh, I'm here uh, today to tell you how you can benefit from data uh, that will uh, come uh, to you from Stratosphere. Um, we designed uh, our uh, hubs high altitude pseudo satellite uh, around the uh, development uh, that has been done on the electronic side for the CubeSat in the past decade. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about optical images, infrared images, radars, leaders, and uh, other instruments uh, that are used uh, for remote sensing of the Earth's surface. Uh, we have been uh, highly supported uh, from the European Space Agency. We won the Galileo Masters in 2018 and then uh, became one of the ESA Big Prague. Uh, alumni and in 2022 we received a, uh, a grant uh, to actually build our high altitude pseudo satellite from our ITT1 framework program. Uh, Skyreader is a lighter than air hubs. Uh, it can uh, operate uh, at altitude approximately 20 kilometers. We can fly missions with the duration up to six months and we can accommodate payloads up to 12 kilograms. Uh, it is very important also that we have a station keeping capability, which means that we can uh, stabilize our platform on uh, one geostationary position, and that is in winds up to 15 meters per second. Uh, the uh, advantages of uh, this solution is that it is actually complementary to the satellite market, so we can bring uh, uh, imagers uh, with better resolution from some specific sites, uh, we fly above all the weather and air traffic, and we do have a, a very high level of autonomy, so we can just uh, uh, actually uh, give uh, our hubs uh, coordinates and it will, it, it will fly there. We also do not, because we fly on helium and solar power, so we don't do emit any CO2 emissions. Now, uh, let's take a closer look to uh, some applications that we can uh, provide from Stratosphere. Uh, natural disasters prevention, that is uh, uh, one of the most important ones, uh, by putting a uh, infrared imager on our platform, uh, we can actually uh, find hotspots inside uh, forests, and then we can prevent, uh, uh, then we can, uh, prevent uh, natural disasters happening by just Picking these hotspots inside the uh, inside the inside the forest. Uh, once the natural disaster happened, it can be uh, fire or it can be a earthquake or a hurricane. Uh, we can very quickly uh, start our hubs and then bring uh, live images uh, of of such a disaster, and uh, we can help to uh, monitor. Uh, uh, for the uh, for the, for the security reasons, we can help to help to monitor the event, uh, so the emergency uh, so the emergency services can have better out outlook of um, of the situation, what is happening uh, where. Uh, we can provide uh, much uh, much better resolution on some specific places. Can be a uh, maybe a glacier uh, uh, that you want to have, have a, a monitored uh, twenty four uh, seven uh, in a high resolution. So you can actually uh, you can actually uh, see uh, some some specific changes on the ice uh, because. Uh, 
we can station keep the uh, the device uh, leader or imager on one place, and then we can uh, we can provide uh, you with the uh, uh, with the live coverage of the of the even for for long periods of time it can be six months. Also, we can uh, we can monitor urban areas. Uh, we can measure CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, we can uh, we can see how the traffic is is going. Also, for the security reasons, we can monitor uh, the city or the urban areas. So uh, this is also a very interesting application. Uh, the same services uh, we can provide the same same services for the for the industry. Uh, by monitoring uh, power plants uh, or uh, pipelines, uh, we can uh, we can check uh, if uh, if there is any leakage of CO2 or, or any other gases uh, for security reasons, or we can uh, see if there is any hotspots on pipelines or uh, or inside the uh, the plants, uh, so we can prevent uh, some some disasters. Uh, the ultimate future for us will be flying in uh, other celestial body uh, atmosphere because once uh, we can uh, we can fly in Earth's atmosphere, it is also possible to fly on Mars or on on Venus uh, by just simply uh, doing some simple uh, uh, simple stuff on on our platform. So it can be very tailored for for different type of atmosphere. Uh, we don't develop any payload, so uh, that's uh, that's why we uh, became part of the Epic because most of the members actually develop uh, uh, di different kind of payloads and communications, uh, communication laser communication links. So we are very excited uh, to being part of this community and uh, to uh, help to grow this industry. So thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy and Noringa for giving me this opportunity to present today at this at this meeting. And uh, now I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your... Okay, I can, I can hear my voice through your, your microphone. Maybe you can mute yourself and you mute when we will have questions. So do we have any questions for, for you, please? For you, please. Yes, Ivan, please. Yeah, very exciting uh, presentation, uh, Yuri. Uh, I'm wondering, this uh, uh, project with Mars, is this something uh, you're working on already? Or is that just a, an a extrapolation of what you're doing? Yes, so it's just a preliminary study uh, phase. So uh, uh, we talked. We talked with uh, with NASA. Uh, NASA NASA in, is interesting in sending, uh, you know, uh, robots and drones uh, into Mars uh, to do the first scouting. So uh, this this is what we uh, talk about them and also. Uh, Actually, using airships uh, for Venus is very, uh, very interesting idea. Uh, there will be missions from NASA to to Venus uh, with airships. So, just right now, it's just an idea phase. Thank you, Yiri. And we have a question from uh, William. Please, William, from Oiba. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your, uh, your talk. Uh, it's just a simple question. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering what are the uh, operating condition uh, at 20 kilometers altitude in terms of temperature, for example. These are uh, these are almost uh, uh, near space conditions. Uh, so you have irradiation almost the same as uh, in space because you are above most of the uh, most of the atmosphere, which is actually good for uh, infrared astronomy because you can then put a telescope on the platform and then uh, you can look uh, into space and see the space in the full spectrum. But uh, it's harsh for the electronics, so uh, almost almost the same conditions 
uh, like in uh, in space, when we talk about irradiation, when we talk about temperatures, uh, it can go as low as uh, minus uh, 70 in, in the night and uh, plus, plus 40 uh, on the day. Okay, thank you. Thank you, William, for your question. And um, yes, Mathieu Maisonneuve from the in Oh, please, Mathieu. Yeah, uh, you talk about the new space condition regarding the uh, radiation, but still um, the vanillin belt is much more upper than 20 kilometers. So basically you will only have cosmic rays, but not proton radiation at all. Can you concur about that or can you, what is your thought about that? Because you, you talk about radiation, which is very similar to space, but there is no Van Allen belt at 20 kilometers of altitude. Yeah, we didn't deep, deep uh, uh, I would say, uh, too, too much into, into this, uh, 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 into into this specific uh, problem, so I don't know about that. Uh, we just we just assume that uh, when we will be above the atmosphere, uh, we won't be shielded by the by the atmosphere. We we sure will be shielded by the magnetic field uh, of the Earth. Yeah, uh, but the fact is, normally there is two Van Allen belts, one ranging from 600 to 1200 kilometers, and the other one it's at the uh, Mu to geo, so basically 24 to 36 and slightly a thousand kilometers away from Earth. But you know, the ISS at 400 kilometers of altitude, they don't have not so much radiation, only cosmic rays. So at 20 kilometers, it will be cosmic rays only. Yeah, better, better for us then. We are basically using the we are basically using the electronics that is used for the CubeSat market, which should be uh, which should be fine. In, in yeah, the, right the, the CubeSat market is not only it's the the electronics on board CubeSat market. Uh, it's not all radar. They are get some radar errands, and there is also some commercial components. Right. Okay. Good. So maybe you could discuss this further, this event, if you if you need more information, Yuri. And uh, if you have no more no more question, I would like to thank you again, uh, Yuri, for your interesting presentation and application. Um, and we can move uh, forward with our next speaker, Ruslan Ivanov from IAR Nova. Ruslan, please, you can share your presentation and start. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, thank you. Okay, you, we can't hear you, Ruslan. I don't know if you're- Are right. we good now? Yeah, good. But can you hear, can you see it? Because I'm we can not see and sure we can hear, what has been shared. It's all good, right? Yes. Good, good then. Well, um, much has been talked today about uh, optical optics or so platforms have been discussed. Uh, I will complement from my side with the detector part of the equation for the imaging systems, right? So I am, uh, my name is Ruslan Ivanov. I am with IRNOVA, I'm development engineer. So today I will um, introduce you the company. I will tell you who we are and what we do, but of course, focus on the topic of the day and I will describe to you a solution, a dual band long wave imager uh, that's intended that we have developed for the specifically earth observation purposes. So starting with the company, we are a privately owned company, Swedish company that is based in Stockholm. Um, we, are, uh, we are a supplier of high-end thermal imagers and have long proven track record with thousands of fielded detectors. This is made possible thanks to the fact that we have in-house full production chain. So uh, we have strong team and the expertise covers everything from the detector design, so like quantum mechanical simulations, all the way to the packaging of the fabricated thermal sensors into the cooled uh, assemblies. 
when you are in the passive thermal imaging mode, you obviously want to tune the sensitivity of your detectors uh, according to the transmission bands of the atmosphere. And as you can see here, that we have a full coverage from mid-wave to very long wavelengths. Uh, we can like uh, split it into two pieces with like mid-wave is mostly covered by the fact by our uh, type two superlattice based solutions. And as a matter of fact, here you can see the size of the system, it's high end. Uh, it's very compact and uh, it's basically it is the uh, we are leaders uh, when it comes to uh, t2sl based swaps on the european market but and since i'm going to focus mostly on the long wave part of the equation here we are relying on the uh, creeps and we are operating pitches down to 15 microns um, so for instance, I will be talking mostly about the solution that is tuned for 10.5 microns. Um, for both technologies, we have a range of products and uh, we are ready to uh, customize the solutions given that the high uh, readiness level of the technologies. Um, so if we, uh, limit ourselves to creeps, then the research has started in the early 90s and a range of products has been developed since then. Uh, I will focus mostly here about uh, one of the recent uh, products, which is a dual filtered uh, creep, quantum well infrared photo detector. How it all started? So, um, this particular product started with when we uh, met a customer, a German startup that is called Constellar. At the moment, they have been like newcomers to the business, uh, but they had a grand vision. They wanted to build a system that would uh, be capable of monitoring water consumption on a global scale. The motivation is, uh, well, simple and noble, you can say, um, given that this over 60% of all fresh water that is used in the agriculture is wasted. By optimizing it, optimizing the fresh water usage, one can simultaneously save a lot of water as well as improve the crop yields. In particular, what you can see here, an example, is a combined image that shows visible and thermal images of the same patch of land. Um, and in green, you can see visible, so lush vegetation. But when you are looking into in the uh, infrared band, then the, um, there are much more details uh, that thread through. Well, uh, you can see that there are certain areas where the uh, water is scarce, the temperature is elevated, crops are at risk, and prevent infections are needed. So. It's good for the purpose, but then what are the challenges? Multiple, but I would want to outline just two in here. You need a good uh, imager, good meaning a very uniform, uh, very with high thermal sensitivity and very stable. That is capable of imaging in dual band mode in long wave infrared. And at the same time, one needs to keep the cost down because uh, if, it, if, it is a, if a startup is to field installation of CubeSats, yeah, you cannot afford the solution that NASA relies on for their meteor sats. Um, so with this request in mind, we came down like, so we started the development and came up with the solution. So we took an off the shelf, essentially focal plan array, quarter VGA, 30 micron page. Here in white, you can see its spectrum. So it has a peak absorption at 10.5 microns. And then we have split the area into two parts by depositing the band pass filters, short pass and long pass respectively. Here you can see how they split the, like the absorption of the detector. So the crosstalk is uh, as low as 10%. 
we managed to maintain, so these filters have been deposited directly onto the focal plane array. And uh, what the benefit of it is that the system now is, is doesn't need uh, an additional, uh, you don't need to cool down the filters. The filters are, the, they are cooled, well, they are kept cold together with the detector itself. Here, for instance, you can see the, this FPA, this, sorry, this thermal imager uh, in a detector cooler packaging. So this is how it looks approximately. Well, not approximately how it looks. Then we ship it to a customer, uh, to the constellar, and they have integrated here. You can see the module. Um, so our module imaging, um, and uh, it sits in a core of this freeform telescope that has been developed uh, by, by Costellar. Here it's the same thing, but fully enclosed. And the size, I would like to emphasize it. It's like the size of a shoe rack. It's very compact, 40 by 10 by 10. And just 18 months, so 18 months is starting from the date when we conceived the idea. 18 months later, uh, this payload has reached the International Space Station, has been installed on the NanoRex test system. It's like it's over there. I cannot really see it. It's called too small and from this angle, but it was quite a feat of an achievement, which is made possible due to the fact that we are very flexible and we are ready to uh, yeah, we are ready to develop uh, a product specifically for the customer need. You can also say that, well, it's all good, it's compact, you did it very fast, but what is the result? Like ultimately it boils down to the image quality, right? Um, in here, these are the imaging results that we have, uh, that the customer have shared with us. They have been very happy when they did this. So, here is a side-by-side -side comparison of some of the missions. So this is uh, imaging the same patch of land. Here you can see it invisible. And here are ESA's Sentinel and the Extras by NASA. Here is uh, our solution. Well, okay, it's a te their telescope with our detector. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can go as bold as claiming that, well, we at least don't have worse. In fact, you can like uh, resolve much more uh, with this solution than with this uh, considerably more expensive and considerably bulky emissions. Um, so the solution is, uh, compatible with the CubeSat formats. And well, this is the idea to uh, introduce, well, to not have them like floating aboard the International Space Station, but to have like a, a swarm of satellites, each equipped with one of such telescopes. All right, so what I would like to print, uh, yeah, like the takeaway point uh, that we are de we deliver high-end system that expand the entire thermal infrared. We are agile and we are uh, very custom. Uh, well, we are custom oriented in a way. So we are ready to customize the products uh, fast for your specific needs and we can overall shorten the development type considerably. Um, as was demonstrated on the example of this dual band long wave imager, uh, a success story, we uh, managed to achieve a very compact imager which produces, which provides a state-of-the-art state, state uh, imaging quality. Um, so with, the, with all this said, like the last point is that what are we uh, ready to provide? I said the imagers, high quality imagers. What we would like as input from the Epic members is your ideas if you, for a systems where, if you have a system in mind where, which needs a thermal imager, 
give us give us a shot. We are always uh, very interested in, in getting any feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruslan. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, so, do we have any question from uh, from the participants? Yes. So we have. Okay, Ivan, please. Yeah, thank you, Ruslan. Uh, this is an impressive system that you, you've shown. I wonder. Uh, so you mentioned that it's uh, it weights uh, six kilograms. Do you see uh, do you see a lot of need for few for future miniaturization of the system? Ah, maybe, well, beyond, maybe beyond, by, beyond that point, you mean? Yeah, maybe by replacing optics with flat optics, maybe even uh, meta lenses, maybe by integrating optics and electronics on the same chip. So going for... Uh, hmm. It is, a, yes, the meta lenses is, is, it is an interesting, yeah, in, interesting topic in itself, even regardless of this particular application. Obviously, it, it always is better to have something even like more compact, something that doesn't have, I don't know, moving parts. It's not the case here, there are no moving parts, but still, uh, like I can answer your question with a general yes. I think that there is a trend of making everything more compact, more mm -hmm. energy efficient and so on, but I'm not really, an, I'm not a system integrator. I cannot really uh, give you um, like tailored uh, response for, yeah. For your request. <laughs> okay, fair enough. There yeah, thanks, Ivan, for this uh, question. Very interesting. Uh, yes, Mathieu Maisonneuve from INO, please, Mathieu. So yes, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. It, it is really interesting to see uh, your development. Uh, uh, although I, I got some, I got two questions. Uh, first of all, is what is the uh, power consumption of your camera uh, in operation? Uh, Please, because once again, I couldn't hear the word. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, what is the power consumption? Of power your consumption. Yes. Because you got to create a cooler, so that shall Nine be watts. quite angry. Nine watts. Nine watts. Okay. And and, and what about the mid time to failure? Because the same. I I don't think that the electronics, not the um, uh, FPA by itself, is an issue. But still, the crowd cooler, you know. Especially a rotary one, as you as you as you show in your, on your slide, uh, tends to get a very limited lifetime. What is your what is the lifetime you you specify? This is a good question. Uh, I don't have the exact number. It's something in years measured, but like in few years, not in many years, not in tens. Okay. So okay. a few years, I would say. But let's say two uh, three I mean, years max, something like that. Yes, I would say so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, yes, Yuri from Stratosist, sorry. You can ask a question. Hello, 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 hello Ruslan, very interesting presentation. I just wanna ask you if it's possible also to use your imager for observing the universe or if it's only tailored to, uh, to the Earth's surface. Thank you. Um, well, in here, it's my more of a personal opinion. I might be wrong, but like there was a mission 20 or so years ago. It was also a quantum bound thread for the detector based. I forgot the name, TISR, I think. Thermal infrared spec or something. T-I-S-R runs for acronym. And they used it for some, for, for yeah, for for some astronomy uh, purposes in astronomy, I don't remember exactly. But generally, I wouldn't say that it's um, the best system for this particular case because quantum inf infrared photo detector it doesn't have very high quantum efficiency. Something that you would really want when you are detecting I don't know stars, photons from some very distant stars. So in there, you would want to have something like type two superlattice. Good, thank you. But, thank but you, this, really. the advantage of this system, and this is not something that I actually like addressed, just to keep uh, presentation time short, is that it is very stable in terms of um, 
well, the non-uniformity correction that any camera would need to be performed. It requires certain set of targets, something that really bulks, like makes it, well, it takes space. It like adds uh, weight and so on. And in here, like when you are working with a creep, what you are doing is you are measuring it once in the lab and then the gain so-called correction map. And then uh, you use it for the lifetime. We have like thousands, okay, no, well, we have hundreds of creeps and uh, it's like, it is based on the experience. So we don't, like customers don't have to recalibrate it again. So this really simplifies the, the camera, the system, because the imaging unit is very stable. So uh, this is its main advantage really. So you kind of save on the uh, components. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we have um, another question from uh, Mathieu Frambourg, Aspherical, please Mathieu. Uh, thank you, and thank you Ruslan for the, for the presentation. Uh, question is simple, are you also developing the imaging system that goes with the, uh, with the detector? Or I've seen the payload that was with the Constellar uh, did you do any of the optics uh, that were in front of the detector? Uh, could you please repeat this one again? Yes. Uh, do you also develop and, and work on the optical telescope that goes in front of the imager? Is part of the optics within your um, development? Ah, okay. If we are developing the optics? Yes. Uh, no, we are not developers of optics. We are focused on uh, providing good detectors. So the telescope itself was done by the Constellar. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. And a question from uh, Gernot Weber from Schott, please. Gernot. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about optics here, um, is there any special requests uh, you have for the optical material in terms of that you want to have a broadband uh, uh, optical material where you can go from the short wave, long wave up, short wave, mid wave up to the long wave so that you have everything in one, in one material? Or uh, are you rather going into like we are separating these different wavelengths and, and have two channels? This is actually an interesting one. So in here, generally, I would say, uh, okay, for Earth observation, perhaps, generally it would be a no, because you cannot have a detector which is good, which covers, which is, you are, there are a lot of trade-offs in terms of operating temperatures and so on, and sensitivities. Um, if you want, like when you, when you go into covering like panchromatic, when you're trying to yeah uh, make something panchromatic. On the other hand, if we are now talking about specifically Earth observation, then with the materials like like T2SLs or MCTs, something that has very broad uh, absorption band, uh, it might actually be interesting, I think. But again, uh, I shouldn't really comment. I'm not an expert. So at the moment, we are developing a long wave tech to superlattice detector. So I cannot really answer from the perspective of our company. But generally, I can imagine that it might be interesting when it comes to hyperspectral images or whatnot. But generally, on the other hand, you yeah, you're always limited by the longest wavelengths you introduce. If you make it, if you are willing, if you if you can live without having with, with only having midway, for instance, your whole system can be like miniaturized by a factor of two at least. <laughs> and the power consumption by a factor of three. So it's it's a question about what you want. Thank you, Janet, for your question. Thanks a lot. And thank you again, Ruslan, for your yeah, presentation. Very interesting. You raised a lot of interest from the participant. And now the last but not least uh, presentation of the day, William Renard from Huriba. So William, you can start and share your presentation. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Epic, for uh, arranging such, uh, such events. Uh, 
Uh, so it's uh, and thank you to all other speakers for the nice uh, presentation. So uh, today I will uh, present uh, Oviba's uh, greetings technologies for uh, space applications and uh, uh, mainly uh, Earth observation. Um, so um, Oviba is. Uh, yeah, okay. So Oriba is a, a company uh, headquarters in, in, in Japan and um, it is, uh, the, the company is, is manufacturing an analytical uh, instruments and components for five, uh, I would say, different application segments from uh, automotive to uh, scientific. And uh, so in the scientific uh, divisions, uh, we are mainly focusing on uh, in analytical instrumentation for uh, molecular spectroscopy, uh, emission spectroscopy, and so on. Uh, and we are also providing uh, systems, uh, OEM systems for uh, industrials, like spectrometers, micrometers, or uh, uh, spectral imagers, uh, cameras, and also gratings. Uh, 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 so OEM gratings for industrial, but also custom gratings. Uh, which will, which will be the main uh, topic uh, of this talk. Um, so the custom ratings, uh, our markets uh, today. Um, so our activity is pitted in four different uh, applications uh, from the VUV and Sequotron uh, application, which which requires uh, high quality um, gratings uh, with uh, full customization. Um, we also have a uh, high energy lasers application, um, and we are very proud uh, today to have uh, delivered the largest grating uh, for a petawatt laser. So the grating size was uh, 1.5 meter uh, by uh, 70, uh, 700 uh, millimeter size. So it's quite impressive. We are very proud of that. We are also working on, on space and uh, as uh, astronomy application since uh, more than 40 years, and we uh, uh, we have worked uh, on more than 15, uh, 50 missions uh, uh, with different uh, primes and uh, uh, space agencies. Uh, so the last uh, market uh, we are focusing today is also post ratings or 2D ratings for uh, for meteorology. So all that uh, custom gratings uh, are uh, designed and manufactured in France um, in the uh, Oribas uh, Center of Excellence, which was uh, formerly named uh, Oriba Jobin Yvon. So, so our, uh, uh, especially all the customers uh, known us as uh, Jobin Yvon Company, uh, because the company was founded uh, 200 years uh, ago uh, by uh, with the collaboration between uh, Auguste Frenel and uh, also uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Soleil uh, in, in France. Um, so now I will uh, focus on our uh, different uh, technologies for uh, manufacturing gratings. So we have two, I would say two families. Uh, the first uh, family is the master's gratings. Um, we have two different uh, possibilities to manufacture uh, such uh, some gratings. Um, so the first one and the well known, uh, I would say, is the uh, holographic recording. So we have um, uh, the substrate here in blue, and uh, we just uh, uh, deposit a, a thin layer of photoresist. And thanks to uh, interferences uh, between two beams, uh, we will uh, record uh, the uh, those interference uh, within uh, in, in the uh, this uh, photoresist layer. Uh, and so we will then get uh, a grating. And thanks to uh, another uh, eye matching process, uh, eye and beam matching, we, we will be able to, uh, to shape um, the grooves and also to transfer the, the, the grooves uh, into the, the substrate material. So thanks to, uh, to that, we are able to, uh, to do sinusoidal shapes, uh, triangular shapes or laminar shapes uh, for uh, the grooves. So for for masters, uh, we have uh, another uh, another way to manufacture the gratings, which is the mechanical railing. So um, on the top of the substrate, we uh, we have a thin uh, aluminium layer, and we uh, 
I would say just uh, scribe, but it's it's not as easy. But uh, uh, we scribe uh, the thin uh, aluminium layer to uh, to 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 have uh, to have the grooves uh, direct directly on the on this on this layer. And we are thanks to that we are mainly uh, doing uh, triangular shapes or blazed uh, gratings. Um, so this is uh, the way to manufacture uh, master gratings, and we have also the uh, the capability to do uh, what we name the replica gratings. So we use um, a master grating like uh, a model, um, and uh, thanks to uh, epoxy resin that we uh, have between uh, the master and a, a new, uh, I would say, a fresh rep replica blank. Um, we are able to, uh, after curing, we are we are able to uh, to just uh, uh, replicate uh, the grating from the master on the top of the uh, the replica brain, blank. Um, and so then uh, the next step are uh, for sure uh, either for the masters or the replica, we are able to uh, to deposit uh, different kind of uh, reflectance uh, coatings uh, on the top of, of the grating. So um, depending on the on the um, I would say the uh, the way to manufacture the grating uh, and the application, uh, we are able to uh, to do uh, or to consider different uh, substrate uh, shape, plane, spherical, toroidal, freeform optics, or prisms, um, different substrate material, different kind of silica on the zero dur also uh, from shot uh, SIC, uh, silicon carbide, or also aluminium depending especially uh, uh, SIC for, uh, uh, I would say, not a uh, heavy material. Um, we are able also to, uh, to uh, thanks to the uh, holographic recording, to uh, include uh, aberration corrections uh, during the recording process to have what we name uh, type four gratings with uh, aberration correction or variable line spacing uh, gratings. Um, so different kinds of group densities from a uh, certain line per millimeters uh, up to uh, uh, for 48 uh, hundreds line per millimeters. Um, as I said, different metallic coatings, typically gold, aluminium, and so on. Um, and thanks to all, all that uh, features, we are able to cover uh, different the, the, the spectrum from deep, deep UV to, uh, uh, to mid infrared. And for sure, um, we are uh, the team, uh, the manufacturing and R&D team are uh, able to do full customization uh, thanks to um, different kind of computation tools uh, from the grating, uh, grating efficiency calculation for sure, and also Dmax optimization uh, to, uh, to to see uh, the, uh, uh, the the implementation of the grating in the uh, in the, the instruments, for example. So after the manufacturing, we uh, have, uh, and especially for uh, for space uh, application, we we have uh, some uh, metrology tests uh, and qualification. Um, so typically for space project, what we uh, what we do is to uh, check uh, after manufacturing the grating uh, profile thanks to uh, atomic force microscopes. Um, we are also uh, doing uh, before uh, recording and after recording uh, the uh, the surface or reference error uh, from the substrate or the gratings with uh, uh, an interferometer. So on the middle here, this is an example of the uh, the interferometer. Uh, uh, here, this is a picture for the large uh, size uh, gratings, but uh, we also have uh, smaller uh, equipment. Um, we also uh, check the uh, the efficiency re relative or uh, absolute uh, uh, to a mirror uh, with the efficiency meter. We check the groove density and all your orientation. Um, we do uh, not uh, in our off uh, in our manufacturing site, but uh, uh, we uh, we are able to compute and also to uh, uh, to ask to our partners for uh, straight measurements so or BRDF or BTDF depending on the uh, on the grating. Um, we also check the micro roughness and also the final uh, step is the visual inspection especially to check that there is no large uh, defect on the on the grating after manufacturing. 
So um, now for the quality and the qualification. So, so the company uh, is uh, uh, ISO 9001 and 14,001 uh, certifications. Um, all uh, our qualification plan are uh, according to uh, a CSS, ECSS standards. Um, and um, 40 years ago, we uh, uh, we were uh, involved in the uh, long duration exposure facility mission. And so we have all this uh, heritage uh, because we uh, we have uh, we had qualified during this uh, this mission uh, three different kinds of greetings that are uh, uh, mainly co covering all our um, uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities. And so we also have uh, the heritage from uh, from past uh, mission. So now I will uh, focus on uh, application example. So just to uh, try to uh, to give you an overview of uh, advantage and drawbacks of uh, different uh, different kind of of gratings. Um, so the first example is the uh, uh, plane uh, or uh, spherical gratings with uh, aberration correction. So such kind of gratings are uh, manufactured uh, through uh, holographic recording um, and uh, that can uh, integrate uh, the aberration correction uh, during uh, the recording. Um, so such a kind of gratings are usually good performances, especially versus the strelites, uh, because uh, mainly the, uh, the, the strelites are uh, is coming from the uh, the roughness or the macro roughness of the of the substrate. So thanks to high quality substrate, we have very good performances uh, versus uh, strelites. Um, so this is an example, a uh, recent uh, example uh, from, from our side. Uh, so the uh, OCO2 uh, mission from, uh, from the NASA, who, where we, uh, we manufactured um, four different gratings for uh, CO2 monitoring on Earth. Um, another kind of grating uh, are the plain ruled uh, effect grating. So what we name a grating is uh, it's a triangular shape like uh, on the picture, and instead of using the uh, the main uh, the main facet, which is the largest facet here, we use the uh, the counter facet here. Uh, so such kind of gratings uh, are manufactured uh, with the mechanical rolling, uh, and we are able to 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 get a high blaze angle. Um, uh, we have recently two uh, examples. So the the the, the one that I'm showing here is the microcam mission from uh, which uh, with the <coughs> with, with the PNES, sorry, and uh, so for for such uh, such project we did uh, replica gratings on uh, silicon carbide uh, substrates, and thanks to that, thanks to this uh, kind of of gratings. Uh, with one grating, we were able to cover with a very high efficiency, more than 50%, uh, four different uh, spectral bands. So uh, from uh, uh, the uh, near infrared to uh, uh, two microns, typically. So this is one feature of this uh, of effect grating, especially uh, um, when the customers are looking for uh, compactness. Um, so the next uh, next slide uh, is uh, for application example is uh, what we are what we did for something and five and what we are doing also for CO two emission. It's to uh, uh, to record gratings on on prisms um, and so uh, so what 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 is done here we have the holographic recording on one side uh, of the of the grid of the prism typically the back face here uh, and we transfer the 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 grating into the into the silica uh, through uh, high energy so the grating the prism is working in transmission and so we are able especially on the uh, on, on trans face here to uh, to have uh, anti reflection cutting um, so, what uh, are the challenges? What were the were the challenges for such uh, such project? Is to get um, high efficiency and low polarization ratio. So, in dashed red here, this is the polarization ratio over the the wavelengths, 
and uh, in the uh, in the purple here, this is the uh, the efficiency uh, hand polarized beam over uh, over the wavelength. So we got very high uh, efficiency thanks to uh, to to this uh, to this design. Um, so this is also one example. So the the, the prism uh, the the benefit is to uh, to have uh, all uh, the, uh, the the layout. Uh, I would say like a linear instead of to have a couple of mirrors um, with uh, with the reflecting uh, uh, gratings. So um, my last slide will uh, focus on one of our um, I would say manufacturing uh, capabilities that is not well known for uh, uh, space uh, community. So this is. Um, this is uh, this kind of rating where uh, developed and, and patented by uh, Oriba for uh, especially VUV applications, so in the, uh, for synchrotrons. And the, uh, the objective and the, the, the benefit here is to have uh, variable group depths. So, um, so this is uh, the substrate here, and we have the gratings uh, like shown in the, in the picture, and we have different uh, group depths uh, along uh, along the groups. So, um, and thanks to that, we are able to uh, to have different um, efficiency uh, versus the wavelengths, uh, which is depending on the position on the on, on the on the grating. So that could uh, help to uh, to get um, higher efficiency in the part of the of the of the spectrum and on the on the uh, on the position on the grating. Um, and also, it's uh, it's possible to have like a, a high average uh, efficiency over a broad uh, a broad, broad wavelength range. So, um, so by design, uh, it's uh, always difficult to have a very high efficiency uh, in uh, in within a large uh, spectral uh, spectral bandwidth. So, so that's maybe something that uh, could be in the uh, in the interest for. Uh, uh, for uh, space uh, application and such kind of gratings uh, are used for VUV. So uh, such design are fully compatible with uh, ultra vacuum, uh, uh, for, for, for example, and also high or low temperatures. So thank you for uh, your attention. So now uh, if you have Question. Uh, I'm here to uh, to to reply, and uh, uh, we can also keep in touch. So you have uh, all my uh, contact here. Uh, you can also meet uh, meet uh, me and the team uh, directly at uh, Oriba France, uh, the custom grading manufacturing site, or we will also attend uh, the two uh, largest events for Photonics, uh, Photonics West in uh, uh, in USA, North America, and also uh, there's a world of Photonics in uh, uh, in June. Um, and so, as I said, the uh, whole team uh, is available to discuss the, the feasibility of uh, your custom gratings for uh, your uh, future uh, instruments for space. Thank you, William. And the peak will be at Photonic West as well, so we'll meet there physically. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, a question from Mathieu Framboise. Here we can, please, Mathieu. Uh, hello, William, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the reminder of the nice moment with the prism for Sentinel-5, which I participated in the past. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had one question. Um, you mentioned the freeform substrate. Is it something that you've already done, or is it something that you are continuing and you think is, is possible to do? No, no, no. That's something that uh, we, uh, we have already done. Um, so... Uh, Based, we, we are not manufacturing our own uh, substrates. So uh, um, typically, for uh, for space uh, applications or not necessarily space, but uh, other applications that are uh, requesting free from optics, uh, usually uh, our customers uh, provide directly the substrates. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and so we uh, we thanks to uh, the um, uh, holographic recording, we are uh, we are able to. Uh, uh, to uh, to to adjust, I would say, our uh, recording setup to uh, uh, to to such kind of uh, of substrates. Okay, because I I, I had some question in the past about uh, deposition depositing some similar uh, than the grading uh, graded coatings on 
free from substrate and it was kind of complicated because of the shape that has to be controlled and the, the beams that you send that needs to be controlled with regards to the shape so i was wondering how far from the from the plano surface you could go for free form for deposition on free form optics for, for for sure we uh, we do have some uh, limitation now. so I, I do not have this uh, precise information uh, in the hands but um, so regarding uh, local, for example, radius of curvature, we are able to do uh, uh, high or low uh, radius of curvature for uh, spherical uh, or toroidal substrates. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's just a, a, a manner of, uh, of uh, optimization. Uh, and uh, also we have to check uh, if it's, uh, for sure, if it's possible. And we have all the, uh, uh, the, the, the computations and all the uh, uh, capabilities to, uh, to to do that. So for, for sure, that requires some uh, some uh, optimization and uh, and for sure discussions with uh, with customers on that. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu, for the question. Any other question for William, please? Okay, so thank you again, William, for your, for your presentation. And uh, before to, to I would like to share a little my screen, a few moments. So yeah, I would like to thank you again all of our speakers. Uh, so Jason Palidwa from Meridian, Fabrizio from Nireos, Laurent from Matter and Bazaar Optics, Niri from Stratosyst, Ruslan from IR Nova, William from Oriba. I would like uh, to thank as well our sponsor, Iridian Aspherican, Actar, Advanced Coating, and SM Optics, of course. And we really hope that you enjoyed this uh, this online technology meeting. And um, here you can find the, the value chain of the today on uh, the website, uh, Epic website. So thanks again to all. And uh, we really hope that you enjoyed this event and see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.